got up before dawn just to bring you. Top of the morning for you for downtown Boston. Welcome to Spirit of the Gables. All of us you will meet here tonight are shades of the great Nathaniel Hawthorne's imagination. I'm Uncle Venner. Well, I'm no one's uncle that I know of. I believe the people of the city have simply called me this because I've lived too long among them. Be that as it may, I'm a wood sawyer. The messenger of everybody's petty errands. The patched philosopher who has studied the world at street corners. And I'm ready to give out my wisdom as the town pump is to give water. <laughs> Did you notice the likeliness this house bears to a human countenance? The traces of change on its face are not merely of storm and sunshine, but expressive also of the long lapse of mortal life and its accompanying vicissitudes. This house has heard shrieks of horror and moans of lamentation from its inhabitants. Yet, you will learn as I have, this house still has secrets to keep, an eventful history to moralize upon as it sits in silence over an unquiet grave. Yet this place becomes the scene of the romantic tale of Phoebe Pynchon and Holgrave, two young people caught in its web, who fall in love, despite the grim shadows of the house and its curse. In this house tonight, you'll meet the malls and the pensions. The malls humble, but in possession of this beautiful piece of land. The pensions wealthy, and ready to testify most vehemently against a poor man to take his home. Here our story begins in blood. Bad blood between these two families. Ancient sins we see take generations to be rectified. You'll discover the secrets of these spirits that hate, but cannot leave this house even though it drains a life out of them. I have witnessed the degeneration of these families, but you guys shall judge for yourselves when you meet them. Our tale is also a study and a warning in which the sins of the fathers, greed, deceit, and murder haunt and cripple their innocent descendants. The overwhelming pride of the pensions and the strange powers of the mall seem to run through the veins of each descendant, reaching out an icy hand which continues to destroy the present generation. I advise you as you're walking down these dark and brooding hallways to keep a warm and sunny smile on your face. Keep your spirits up if you can. It may help when you feel the chill going up through your bones when you're walking through this house of sorrow and fear. Enter if you are of stout heart and strong constitution. You began laughing. <laughs> Why, she is barely mine! And my father and I had no notion of his meaning at this point. Suddenly, I felt such dismay at Matthew's dismissal. It was suddenly such agony not to have him near me. My mind was being ripped in half. I just wanted him near me. I wanted to feel him near me. Since then, a will unlike my own has constrained me to do his grotesque and yet fantastic biddings. This voice, if you're quiet, you can hear it. It's right here in my head. I'll say, Alice, Alice, laugh. <laughs> and my body will convulse with laughter wherever I may be. My limbs 
and we'll move in a loom dance and I will say things I do not mean and I will tear at my hair but I cannot help <laughs> what I am doing because I am powerless. I am Matthew Slave. Tonight, tonight of a sudden I found myself wandering through the streets in the ice and the rain barely clad. I came up on the cottage and began playing maid. Some woman and I dressed her in her bridal finery and I woke to find myself kissing Matthew's new bride. I would hold it. It's cold, it's cold as a hand on my chest, please! You must go, leave me! Leave me now! Welcome to my home. I was born in this house in 1804. This city was my birthplace, but I would not let it be my grave, as I have struggled with the dark knowledge of the horrible taint in my blood, and how I could atone for the sins of my forefathers. I've changed my name from theirs, but still I am haunted by the dreadful deeds of hanging Judge Hathorne and his father William. All of my life I've tried to cleanse my soul of their sins. I have never been more vividly unable to rest than in this house and the city of Salem. My first ancestor on these shores was William Hathorne, who came with a sword and a Bible to Massachusetts in 1630. He was a harsh magistrate who pursued the wicked like a bloodhound. It is recorded that he punished one burglar not just with the cutting off of an ear, but he also branded his forehead with a bee. I can smell his seared flesh in my dreams and hear his cries. I awaken in a cold sweat, filled with thread as though it was my fate. But he was never more cruel than when it came to the punishment of women. Anne Coleman's crime was being a Quaker. He had her stripped naked to the waist, tied to a cart, and dragged through Main Street, with a constable to follow with a whip of knotted cords. She received ten lashes in Salem, ten in Boston, ten in Dedham, and then was driven into the forest. Her blood is on my hands, and I write with it night after night. Her sobbing screams are as real to me as had I held the whip in my own hand. He enforced the Puritans' patriarchal laws with a sadistic zeal. It turns my stomach. John Hathorne, William's son, is known to all as the Hanging Judge. My great-great-grandfather hanged nineteen innocent people for witches and crushed one honest man. He created an unquenchable hysteria with his adherence to spectral evidence as sufficient proof to hang a witch. This gave no possible defense to the accused as the girls cried out their sick imaginings. When all others, including the girls, had confessed and regretted the evil they had done, my great-great-grandfather alone stood unrepentant of his responsibility for the infamous Salem witch trials. His legacy to me is the guilt of the cost. Hundreds of lives ruined, the horrors of those lost, to hanging, torture, imprisonment, and starvation. These souls seek me in the dark of night and bid me right. I cannot sleep, I cannot leave this city, but hate to stay. My guilt and shame are unbearable burdens that I attempt to expiate with words, words, thousands of words, millions of words, but the ghosts of the innocent still cry out for justice in my sleep, and I awake to write more words, words to comfort them or myself, I do not know, but the legacy of the hanging judge and his father is a millstone and a scourge. I pray that you will help me to rest, and these poor spirits whose unquiet souls demand a fair hearing and a promise from you, a promise I make with every word I write, that they will not have died in vain, only knowing that you will stand up against such hatred, such prejudice, such abuse of power against the powerless can ease their torment. Help me, help me, please. I cannot sleep. I, I cannot rest without your promise. Help these spirits you will encounter to their rest. Went to this house, rotten with greed, insanity, and death. The land upon which this house decays has been poisoned by the evil deeds of the pensions and my revenge upon them. This land was mine. I built my home here. My children were born here. But the wealthiest man in town envied me. 
the spring fed well, this lovely view. He tried to take it from me in the courts, but I held the deed to this property. He did have a deed, but towards the lands of Maine, not here. I rejoiced too soon when the courts found in my favor. The greed of Colonel Pynchon grew more malignant with delay. When the witchcraft hysteria gripped this town, he saw his way. Colonel Pynchon had me accused of witchcraft by condemning me with malicious gossip and outright lies. Though I protested my innocence, no one would hear me, and I would not confess to a lie, even if it was to save my own life. Colonel Pynchon counted upon my stubborn honesty to work in his favor. And soon enough, he had my wife and children in the street. The title to my land. As a witch forfeits all property, by his accusations, I was condemned to death. I was hanged on Gallows Hill. With my last breath, I cursed him. God will give you blood to drink. The proud colonel thought me as powerless, dead as I was alive. He tore down my humble home and hired my son, Thomas, to build the grandest mansion ever seen in this town. The house of the seven gables upon which you stand is cursed. Every board, every stone. My son Thomas saw to the building of some secrets into this monument of cruelty and dishonesty and has hidden something precious to the pensions where they will never find it. But that is not enough payment for my life and the suffering of my family. No, I have haunted this house for generations and will continue to do so until all the debt the pensions owe me is paid in full. Colonel Pynchon wanted to open this house with a grand celebration. It was food and drink for the entire town. But when his grandson, Gervais, went to find his grandfather to open the house, he found him dead in his study. <laughs> God gave him blood to drink. As my blood was spilled, so was his. <laughs> but it wasn't enough. My hatred of the pension still consumes me. I cannot rest until all the pensions are dead or my land is returned to me. Over the generations, the pensions have been died horrible deaths or have been driven mad by me and the hatred that torments me and will not let me rest. I am condemned to wander through this house until all the wrongs are righted or my land is returned to me. I am as tortured by my own curse as the pensions. <laughs> if you see a candle flicker or a dark shadow in a corner, know I'm there. <coughs> Enter if you dare this curse, this evil house. <coughs> If you are seeking Master Gervais' pension, I'm afraid you'll be disappointed he ain't in. He only recently returned from Europe. I think he hates this place. This wretched old house, he calls it. Well, you can hardly blame him, though. He was a mere child when he found his grandfather, old Colonel Pynchon, dead in his study, all covered in blood. Uh, have you tried coffee? Master Gervais said it's the newest beverage in France and not taking a strong liking to it. Oh, he is always going on and on about how much he misses France and Venice and England. I bet he'd still be there if he had the money. He craves money that one. Why, look at what he did to his own daughter. Old Colonel Pynchon had a grant of land for Maine. Master Gervais, he wants that land. He goes on and on. Why, if I had that land, I could measure my state miles rather than acres. I would return to Europe and live life royalty. <laughs> but the deed vanished when the old Colonel died. Uh, rumor is it was buried with a wizard by the name of Matthew Maul. Now, Maul was hanged back in the witchcraft scare. Some say his ghost still haunts his house, but I don't think Master Gervais believes that. 
But he did believe that old Ma's grandson, young Matthew Ma, was himself a wizard who could see many things. Just a month ago, he summoned young Ma to this very house. I was there when that man came walking through the front door, proud as the devil. Master Gervais asks, can you find that deed for me? Young Ma comes back, I will try if you promise this house as payment for my success. <laughs> and him just a carpenter. Well, Master Gervais agreed, saying, if I have the deed, what need do I have for this house? Why, well, he even agreed to let that man use his own daughter, Miss Alice Pynchon, as a means to communicate with the deed. I saw what happened. Miss Alice came down and the wizard began to wave his arms and speak in incantations. Master Gervais turned his back. I heard Miss Alice say, ever so softly, no. And Master Gervais said nothing to stop it. It was all for nothing in the end. Miss Alice could not provide any information about the deed. Uh, then young Ma commanded Master Gervais to wake her. Why, he went over and he shook her and he screamed at her. But she's not awake. Then young Ma laughed and went to wake her. Well, she did. But I swear she has been under his spell ever since. It's such a pity. She was such a beautiful, courteous woman. The hostess to all of her father's grand dinners in this very room. And now she dances uncontrollably and shouts right out in church. So Master Gervais locked her up in the attic. I have to get back to work now. You go up there and you see what he has done to her. You can use a servant's staircase. There, right by the fireplace. Careful, it's a very tight fit. It's not perfect. Please use that door there. Otherwise, watch your steps, watch your head. Please, please do not push or knock on the door at the very top. It will let you in there already. And just please move along. Once you're in, you're in. see you there. Uh, I'm unwell, you see. They keep me here because I embarrass the great pension name. I might merely a thing kept in shadows. Once, not long ago, though, I was my father's greatest joy, his pride. I always told all the skills and talent the ladies should know. One of my greatest joys was music in the harpsichord. I am a very accomplished player. My father thought I'd make great match and be able to follow his position in the world, and now I will never marry and can scarce trust myself to go out amongst decent company. My father cannot stand to see me tear at my hair, or I'll say words I do not mean, or I'll laugh aloud in church. And all of this came about the day my father's greed overwhelmed us. He summoned Matthew Ma, the late wizard's grandson, and asked him where the deed to Maine was. And well, Matthew, Matthew was appalled by this haughty summons and said the only way to obtain the deed was through a crystal clay median of a pure virgin intelligence. His daughter and I were summoned to be put into a trance. It was alarming to think that that huge man was going to focus all of his energy on me, and yet Matthew told me to relax and give all my energy over to him, and it was so peaceful. Surrendering to that man, these visions, visions, came into my mind from I know not where, and then I saw it. I saw him, Colonel Pynchon, he, he had blood on his collar and he was coming toward me and just as he was about to tell me where the deed to Maine was, the ghost of Thomas and Matthew Mall came and choked him. The blood poured from his lips into his beard and everything went black. Perhaps I fainted. When I became aware of my surroundings again, I heard my father angrily ordering Matthew from out the house while Matthew, Matthew began laughing. <laughs> Why, she is barely mine! And my father and I had no notion of his meaning at this point. Suddenly, I felt such dismay at Matthew's dismissal. It was suddenly such agony not to have him near me. My mind was being ripped in half. I just wanted him near me. I wanted to feel him near me. Since then, a will unlike my own has constrained me to do his grotesque and yet fantastic biddings. This voice, if you're quiet, you can hear it. It's right here in my head. He'll say, Alice, Alice, love. <laughs> <laughs> and my body feels convulsed with laughter wherever I may be. My limbs will move in a little dance, and I will say things I do not mean. And I will tear at my hair, but I cannot help <laughs> what I am doing because I am powerless. I am Matthew's slave. 
<sighs> tonight, tonight of a sudden I found myself wandering through the streets in the ice and the rain, barely clad, and I came upon a cottage and began playing maid to some woman, and I dressed her in her bridal finery and awoke to find myself kissing Matthew's new bride. I would hold it. It's cold. It's cold as a hand on my chest. Please, you must go. Leave me. Leave me now. I love to blow bubbles. <laughs> My cousin Phoebe, who's come to live with us and I, we love to sit by this window and I blow bubbles on the people passing below. <laughs> My name is Clifford Pynchon, and uh, I don't recognize any of you. Now, perhaps that's because I just returned to live at this house after spending 30 years in prison for the death of my uncle. I didn't do it. I did not murder him. But my cousin Judge Jaffrey says he has evidence to prove to the contrary. Well, I don't remember. I do not remember. Well, death is the curse of the pensions. The man who built this house, Colonel Pynchon, he died here. His great-grandson died here. My uncle died here as well. Death follows the pensions. Did I just hear a bell? Well, perhaps my ears are playing tricks on me. I thought I heard the bell to the shop that my sister Hepzibah just opened. You, you see, my late uncle's will gave this house to cousin Jaffrey. But the will also stated that my sister Hepzibah might remain here as long as she was alive. Secret about this house. I, I, I learned it many years ago when I was young and living here. Within one of the walls of this house is, is a secret compartment, and there lies hidden the deed to the family land in Maine. Now, now Cousin Jaffrey's looking for that deed. I won't tell him where it is. I won't tell any of you either, because if, if he knows that you know, you might find yourself spending a few years in prison too. My sister Hepzibah has been very good to me. I know she looks a bit cross these days. There's a scowl on her face. I think this is more she's having trouble seeing than any bad intentions. At first I thought she was cross with me, but I know now this is not the case. The world has changed so much since I was here when I was young. It's a very scary place. and. I, I, I do not venture out much. I, I do go in the garden, and I enjoy watching people through this window with Cousin Phoebe. Well, she's a very nice girl. She's come here to live with us and help about the house, mind the shop, and tend the garden. Oh, it's a lovely garden. Uh, we often sit in the garden summer house. Oh, I enjoy that very much. Phoebe's come across some beautiful roses growing there, and she tends them. I think the smell of those roses I'll associate always with her. My sister Hepzibah believes Alice Pynchon planted those roses many, many years ago. Now, if you would turn around, please, and go down this staircase on my right, the guide will take you next to Cousin Phoebe. <coughs> not a good idea that I stay. Her brother Clifford had just returned from jail and she did not have the means to support us. But I think her attitude has changed. I help around the house and Clifford has taken a liking to me. I can't imagine not being here. I plan to return to my mother very soon to make the final arrangements to stay with Hepzibah and Clifford permanently. Poor cousin Clifford. Have you seen him about the house? He often goes to bed very early. 
Such a gentle man, so kind and timid. I can't imagine him murdering anyone. I never even knew he existed. My mother kept it a secret from everyone. I am sure she'd know the family shame known. But if she knew Clifford, I am sure she would feel as I do. The real shame is that the judge inherited all the family money, leaving Hepson with such a meager amount to live on. Now with Clifford and I living here, she's had to find the means to earn even more money with our penny shop. I help her every day. It's wonderful to meet the neighbors and help them find whatever things they need. When I have some free time, I love to sit in a beautiful garden beside the house with Cousin Clifford. Uncle Venner is often working there and he tells us fascinating stories about the town's history. Cliff and I particularly enjoy the rose bushes that my great great granddaughter Alice Pinchin planted. Alice has been dead for many years, but the rose bushes bring us great joy. Alice had a very tragic life. Have you heard the stories? They say she went crazy. She died a few days after returning from a mysterious errand in the rain. Some people find this house depressing because of all the sorrows it has witnessed. But Cousin Hepsi was still managed to find a boarder. His name is Mr. Holgrave. He's a daguerreotypist who captures images with sunlight. The subjects of the daguerreotype look so stern and unfriendly. I didn't like him at first. I thought he was a, a cold, calm observer of life. But now that I know him, I love sitting in the garden and listening to him talk. Once, he pointed to the well and told me that I must never drink from it. He said that it is called Maul's Well and is believed to be cursed. He is unusual, but I do find him attractive. He's very mysterious about where he was born and insists that he has only a minimal education. But he knows everything. I think he is quite wonderful, in fact. Oh, but have you met my other cousin, Judge Jaffrey Pynchon? There is something about him that I simply cannot like. He had something to do with poor Clifford's imprisonment. Hepzibah won't let him into the house. I don't know the details. I have tried to like him. After all, he is family. But for all his friendliness, I do feel he is false. Hepzibah is terrified of him and shakes whenever she sees him. And I know this may sound strange. But I swear I have heard an odd gurgling noise coming from his throat. Oh, but have you been to Hepzibah's penny shop yet? If there are any small things you need, I'm sure you'll be able to find them there. Her shop is just down the stairs. Don't be put off by the scowl on her face. It's just the poor woman needs glasses. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope you enjoy your visit. Telling these people how much I ate this penny shop. I'm no good at it, and I wish Phoebe would come down and help me out, but she's worked all day, and now it is my turn. Oh, she's much better at it than I am. I'm ashamed that I, Hepzibah Pynchon, had been reduced to running a penny shop. I find it hard to accept that in order to have enough money to pay for my own food, I'm selling eggs and cookies. Oh, but I had to open this shop when my brother Clifford returned from prison not too long ago. He was sent away for 30 years for a murder he did not commit. I know in my heart that he was innocent. Oh, in prison changed Clifford. When they sent him away, he was a handsome young man. And he had such a gentle soul and, and he loved things of beauty. Well, he still has that gentle soul, and he still loves beautiful things. Prison did not take that away from him. And the years have not been kind to me, either. I fear that he finds me repulsive to look at. Oh, but I still love him. And I'll tell you a secret I've never shared with anyone before. I carry a picture of my brother Clifford. He was a young and handsome man. And I hold him dear to my heart. Oh, but regardless, it was when Clifford returned and Phoebe arrived, I had to open the shop. I had enough money for myself, but there wasn't enough for three of us. And my only other choice was to ask my cousin Jeffrey for help, and I refused because I hold him responsible for Clifford's going to prison. And if you see him outside this house, please don't let him in.
Oh, oh, he professes great love for Clifford, but don't you believe him. He can sound very sincere when he wants to. Oh, when I've tried to stand up to him and tell him right to his face what they think of him. But whenever I confront Jeffrey, he disorients me so I, I get so weak in the knees I can hardly stay standing. But I will stay strong. I'll stay strong for Clifford. He's the one person that I'd do anything for in this life. And in order to raise a little extra money, I've rented one of the rooms in this house. Current boarder is Mr. Holgrave, and uh, he seems to dabble in a lot of different things, and uh, he's taken quite a liking to Phoebe, too, mm -hmm. just as we all have. Oh dear, Phoebe, I, d I don't know what I did without her. Well, she's upstairs now packing. She's going to visit her mother in the country and make arrangements so that when she comes back, she can stay here permanently. I don't know what I'll do without her. <laughs> I get frightened when I think of running the shop and, and taking care of the feet. And you're not going to buy anything, are you? You! I need your help, please. Would you open that door so these sure. people can leave my shop? <laughs> please, go. Go, shoot. My name is Holgrave and I'm a daguerreotypist. I create images of people using light. Of course, creating daguerreotypes is just my latest fancy. I've had a varied career. Schoolmaster, newspaper editor, I have even studied and practiced dentistry. I've even given public lectures on mesmerism, a science in which I have some natural endowments. awareness of the supernatural as did my ancestors. And they say the deceased Alice Pynchon plays that instrument in the corner just before another Pynchon dies. Oh, Clifford. Have you seen Clifford? Was he well? That poor man spent many years in jail for a crime that I believe he did not commit. But as a Pynchon, guilty of his crime or not, he was destined to suffer. A black curse has been placed on this house, and the men and women of the Pynchon family have died here since the day they inhabited it. The past haunts this house. And it is my opinion that this moss-grown and rotten monument to the past should be torn down. All lifeless institutions should be pushed out of the way and buried, so that everything can begin anew. I hate this house. I hate living here. Well, then why am I staying, may ask? This house is my past. I dwell here that I may understand my fate. Living here has become a bit easier since Phoebe arrived. Phoebe makes this house seem like a home to me. Oh, I love to sit in the garden and talk with her. I feel sorry for her. And her cousins. And I pledge to aid those unfortunate beings however I can. You see, my fate is intertwined with theirs and this house. My name has not always been Holgrave. I have changed it. I was born a Maul. Descended from the Matthew Maul who was sentenced to death so many years ago by the man who built this house. Colonel Pynchon. I study the way we may all be free of the past. Oh, I think I hear Judge Jeffrey Pynchon at the door, the descendant in that line who has inherited in full measure the cruelty and cunning of his ancestors. Beware his friendly grin. It's lethal. Well, it's time for you to go now so that I may complete my next portrait. Um, and it's for public access channel five. Um. Looks like my cousin's not going to answer, now does it? <coughs> Hedgebar, please come answer the door. 
I'm on a mission of mercy, really. I have. I don't think I've been incarcerated, you know, for for my uncle's death. It, it is terrible tragedy. I'm, I'm very sad. I've got another engagement this evening. One is so burdened by social appearances. Everyone wants to shake hands with the next governor. <clears throat> I'm worried about Clifford. You see, the whole town saw him hanging out of window, and I'm concerned for his safety. I'd like to take him into my personal care. He needs refinements and comforts that I have, and, uh, and I'm anxious to share with him. I just need to clear up a little mystery. Uh, a mystery. A mystery that no doubt he has the answer to, for he was there as well at the end at my uncle's death. The deed, you see, has never been located, and it is to a great tract of land in Maine. It would mean a great deal to me, or to the voters of the state, to have a piece of land like that to rule. I want that land. It has been raised amongst us. But here am I, Judge John Hathorne, to search him out. Devil and all his minions. I'm glad you have come here to help me find your error and bring you to confess. What evil spirit have you familiarity with? Hmm? Answer me. No, I have one. <laughs> have you made no contract with the devil? No. Come, come, do not waste my time. Sin and the devil will have you by the throat this night if you do not confess yourself and name those you have seen in league with him. You cannot remain silent and expect to see heaven or live a long life here in Salem. In Salem we reject the devil and all his works. My father taught me well to see those who are evil those who do not submit to God's law is known to us of the true faith. Only in the Puritan values do we see the true way that God intended us to live. There must be complete adherence to the true way of God. Now, you have all seen the spectral evidence in court as clearly as I have. The witches in this town are torturing our poor girls. These children are under an evil hand that throws them into fits, bites, scratches, and pinches them. The ones of dark power make them cry out horrible words in court and do such uncontrolled violence as I have never before seen. It is well known that the best witness against a witch is a victim as witchcraft is an invisible crime, except to its victim. But we have had incontrovertible spectral evidence. No one can question that these girls are bewitched. The devil is abroad in Salem, I tell you! I know the signs of the devil! He cannot fool me! The practice of maleficium will end in Salem, when we have found out the devil's spawn. A witch is cleverly coached by the devil. You may see her laughing, smiling, and meeting, dancing or merry-making, fashioning dolls, questioning the wisdom of her husband, or of God's chosen ministers, or the dignitaries of this court. Hear you any whisper. You must come to us to prevent the rot from spreading to your crops, to your livestock, to your children, to your very souls. Perhaps your souls are already one, but you do not confess. The girls have seen these marks all over you. They know your foul deeds done in the dark and the secrets that you hide. You will be rooted out and the devil with you. I will imprison you, beat you, starve you, tar and feather you, brand you, and I will hang you to have the devil out of 
of you and good people of Salem. Confess to me and you will live. Confess or be damned. And being much disturbed at it, by advice, we went to Salmon Village to see if the afflicted did know me. We arrived there 24 May. We sat that day long in the court and watched the most strange goings-on. Girls shouting out so that neither judge nor accused could be heard to answer. The girls sauntered about and created disturbances. If any restraint were tried upon them, they fell down into fits. I felt sure we had wandered into a madhouse. After a day of witnessing these strange proceedings, my husband, Nathaniel, approached Reverend Hale, an officer of the court, to make the request that we might meet the girl who had accused me. We then retired to Ingersoll's Inn for a cup of cider. Of a sudden, the doors burst open, and a pack of screaming girls entered, crying out that I was witching them. They smashed dishes and tables in a frenzy, and there was a warrant for my arrest. We were led away to a back room where the judges were all waiting. Being brought before the justices, my chief accusers were two girls. I declared that I never had any knowledge of them before that day. I was forced to stand with my arms stretched out like so. Nathaniel did make the request that he might hold one of my hands, but it was denied me. I then desired for him to wipe the tears from my eyes and the sweat from my face, which he did. I then desired to lean myself upon him, saying I should faint. Well, just as Hathorne replied, she had strength enough to torment those persons, why she should have strength enough to stand. Nathaniel, being extremely troubled at their inhumane dealings, uttered a hasty speech that God would take vengeance on them and desired that God would deliver us out of the hands of unmerciful men. Then my condemnation was writ. I was committed to prison. Nathaniel went thither to the trials to see how things were there managed and finding that spectral evidence was there received together with idle, if not malicious, stories against people's lives. Well, he did easily perceive which way the rest would go, for the same evidence that served for one would serve for all the rest. Nathaniel acquainted me with my danger, and feared that if I were carried off to Salem to be tried, I might never again return. He did his utmost to free me by legal means, but when all failed, we knew escape to be the only way to preserve my life. We traveled first to Rhode Island, but found there was no safety there from their cruel hands. But New York welcomed me, as it had others fleeing before me. Nathaniel wrote, I must speak of their usage of the prisoners and the inhumanity shown to them. No sober Christian could bear it. They had also trials of cruel mockings, which is the more, considering what a people for religion, I mean the profession of it, we have been. Those that suffered, many of them being church members, and most of them being unspotted in their conversation, till their adversary, the devil, took up this method for accusing them. To witness those that suffered within the prisons, please continue on into the next room. <coughs> laughing and playing there. It gets me through the freezing nights and hungry days remembering happier times when God was good to me. When my husband was accused of witchcraft like his father, he escaped. But it was hard on me and the children, and I didn't think it could get no worse. But I was wrong. They cried to me, witch said I was pinching them and scratching them as a devil bitten, but I saw no devil and I heard nothing but the girls shrieking. And there had been them. They've been trying to buy our house at too cheap a price, no one we needed money. Only now they were free to have it, me and my husband being witches and having no right to our property. Well, 
My sister took the little ones in, thank the Lord. But I miss them so. My husband is safe, but where he is, I do not know. <laughs> Forgive me. There'd be so many of us in jail, it's hard to keep count. Two to three hundred have an accuser in, our, in jail. We have all lost everything. Some of us had nothing to lose to begin with. But some high and mighty folk have also been marked low and thrown into the same pot. Elizabeth Carey be one such lady among us once. But she, she run free one night. Of course, there are the good people hanged. Bridget Bishop, Sarah Good, Sarah Wilds, Elizabeth Howe and Susanna Martin, George Jacobs and John Willard. Alice Parker, even even Mary Parker. I ask myself, how could it be that such such godly woman as Rebecca Nurse and her sister Goodwife Eastie was hanged? But then their sister Goody Cloyce done confessed to being a witch and she dost live. How she can live with such a lie upon her lips, I do not know. When her two good sisters be hanged for telling the truth. But then people done made a lot of mistakes in the court, thinking they'd get a fair hearing. Giles Corey, he said some mad things about his wife Martha, about the cat and the cow acting strange, and maybe she was a witch. Martha thought the whole thing so silly that she laughed through half of her hearing. And that itself seemed proof enough for the hanging judge. Martha be hanged, and Giles crushed for not answering. All he wore a wildly old box, he knew his son would not inherit where he hanged for a witch, so answer he would not. There be so many brave, honest, respectable folk killed. Even young John Proctor would not tell the lie to save his life. And craziest of all is the court hanging a man of God, the Reverend Thoros. Oh, he made some powerful enemies with long memories that would have his blood. But the hangings, they did seem to quell the fever for blood. Well, that and the girls reaching too high, of course. Calling up the Governor Phipps' wife and the Reverend Hale's wife. <laughs> By January of this year, 1693, a new court was formed, releasing prisoners as their spectral evidence, which it condemned us, was known not to be admitted in court. But for so many of us, it's too late. There were those of us who has died in prison. Sarah Osborne be one. There were those like myself who cannot be paying fees for the jail and the court and the board. The whole time we'd be here in jail, well, the likes of us can never go home. We be here till we die. So though our names be clear, our lives are forfeit to this hanging judge and his brethren. Will I go to die with no lie upon my lips? But help me, God. It is my last request that, that you stand against this hysteria of fear and look into your own souls for the truth for, before you go slandering your neighbor. Or I warn you, it could be you here standing next to me in this cell. Do you see it there in the shadows by the tree? I, I cannot make it out that its shape is unnatural. I see it. I see a shape moving along the ground towards the house. The heaven shape has begun to shift. See how it begins to fly?
You are the ones. You are the ones! You're the... This way, please. I desire to be humbled before God for that sad and humbling providence that befell my father's family in the year about 92. That I, and Putnam Jr., then being in my childhood, should by such a providence of God be made an instrument in the accusing of several persons of a grievous crime, whereby their lives were taken away from them. Whom well, now I have just grounds and good reason to believe that they were innocent persons, and that it was a great delusion of Satan that deceived me in that sad time. I justly fear that I have been instrumental with others, though ignorantly and unwittingly, to bring upon myself and this land the guilt of innocent blood. What was said or done by me against any person, I can truly and uprightly say before God and man that I did it not out of any anger, malice, or ill will to any person. For I had no such thing against one of them. What I did was ignorantly being deluded by Satan. And particularly as I was chief instrument in the accusing of good wife nurse and her two sisters. For this, I desired to lie in the dust and be humbled for it, in that I was a cause of so sad a calamity to them and to their families. I earnestly beg forgiveness of God and from all those unto whom I have given just cause of sorrow and offense, whose relations were taken away or accused. On this 15th day of January, 1697, I, Samuel Sewell, judge of the court of Salem in the matter of the witchcraft trials of 1692, do make my confession to the people of this congregation. I, Samuel Sewell, sensible of the reiterated strokes of God upon myself and my family, do confess to the guilt I have contracted decision to hang my neighbors for witchcraft that I made under the commission of Boyer and Terminer at Salem. And upon many accounts, more responsible than any others that I know of. And because an affliction of guilt, desire to take blame and shame for what I did. I ask the pardon of men, and especially desire your prayers. God, who has an unlimited authority, pardon my sin and all of the sins. The decisions I have made and the results of those decisions weigh on my conscience. I ask that God, according to his infinitely benign nature and sovereign power over all things, not visit my sins upon me or any of mine in not my flight across the land. God would powerfully defend me against all future temptations to sin. Thou save me the saving conduct of my word and spirit. I do solemnly swear 
to a day of penance each and every year that I shall live. Pray that the future generations will also observe this day that the spirits of the slain innocent shall be at rest. And that through this day of remembrance, never again will such a crime be perpetrated against humanity. Oh no, you come again, you unquiet spirits from Gallows Hill, where guilt and frenzy consummated the most execrable scene that our history blushes to record. Gallows Hill. This is the field where superstition won her darkest triumph, the high place where our fathers set up their shame unto the mournful gazes of generations far remote. The dust of martyrs is beneath our feet. John Proctor, have I not written of shame and dark deeds enough? Rebecca Nurse, have I not cautioned the world to look first at our own sins before they go in search of the sins of others?